Welcome to another episode of the Waffle Shop Podcast. Today, I'm joined by singer-songwriter Nate James. Welcome to the Waffle Shop. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks for having me. It's genuinely a pleasure. You have kept me kind of bopping, I'm going to say, over oh, these nice. past kind of few weeks. Like, it's been funky, is what I'm going to say. Days. Happy days. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? I'm really good, mate. Yeah, um, I'm uh, up in Lancashire. My friend, uh, little Laura, lives up here, so I'm just having a little time out in her lovely little farmhouse cottage in uh, this sleepy little village um, before I head back to London and start another week. So, yeah. Back to the rat race. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what they call it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. you got it. (laughs) I had to double-check then what I just said. This is what happens. I don't even think sometimes it just... It's like verbal diarrhea. That's fine. Less (laughs) feels is better as far as I'm concerned. Perfect. So you're the perfect person to waffle with then. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of waffles, I start one of my shows with something called the Weekly Waffle, which is something quite minor and petty, but it gets on my nerves. Once I've spoke about it with my guest, it makes me feel better. Um, but what's been winding me up this week is <laughs> is um candles and candle names. Now I don't know if you've, if you're like me, you know, I, I like to treat myself on payday with like a new candle. I'm a big fan of like, you know, a nice smell, a chill out. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you get, some, you pick some of these candles up and like the kind of wax melts and you're like, who in God's name, like named these, like some of them are like festival. And then you're smelling, you're like, that is not what a festival smells like. <laughs> No, yeah, I don't know whether it's like the people that produce them or if they have a really <clears throat> clever marketing team that come up with these bright ideas, but you're right, they don't fit. I love candles too, so yeah, I totally get what you're saying. It's, it's just some of them, you're just like, what the hell? Like citrus yeah. breeze, and you're like, when have you ever sat around like, this breeze smells citrusy? Like, yeah, it, just, no. it just doesn't work. It never, ha- I mean, I, I love going into like TK Maxx or something like that and just going to the candle yes. section and just stand there for like half an hour just sniffing them all. <laughs> I, to be honest, I super tape over the name, to be honest, and just smell it because I know I like it rather than have to read what some bright spark came up with. In the <laughs> it's <process>. true. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Like, I'm just going to, next time I'm in there, if you see me in Asda with like a, a blindfold on in the candle, <laughs> just find your business. <laughs> 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 I feel better for it now. Um, is there anything that gets on your nerves that you would like to get off your chest today? Um, what gets on my nerves? So I used to work in like pubs and restaurants and bars um, as a manager and so on when I was younger. And yeah. when I'd go out for food in a restaurant and I'd finish my food, if the plates are on the table longer than like five minutes, it does my absolute nutting. <laughs> I just feel like it's, it's an OCD, maybe it's an OCD thing, but it just feels so messy. I'm like, you've walked past my table three times. You've got nothing in your hands. I'm not saying this <laughs> wenching staff in general because I used to be one, but I'm like... Yeah. If you're going out with plates in your hand, take some back when you go back to the kitchen. <laughs> it's not rocket science. And I've got do, do you think there's like a... I've, I've eaten a lot of food and there's lots of there's lots of remnants and you know, there's bones like a graveyard here. Like get out of the way so people don't think I'm a pig. <laughs> so quickly hide the shape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do as well because if like if you've if you've left like kind of like a few chips or something and the longer they're there, the more chance you're gonna have of eating them. Yeah. Even though you know you're full, it's just because yeah. they're there and they're in I mean, reaching distance. Absolutely, I feel like there's some kind of like etiquette, isn't there, when it comes to it? Like, do you put are you a like a knife on the fork? Kind of, I've finished. Are you like a wipe your mouth with a napkin, put it on the plate? Like, how, how do you? <laughs> I don't know why we're talking about this. But... <laughs> right, you know, with the, especially, I mean, I love, I love chicken in general, but yeah, I'm more of a lick the fingers, probably go to the toilet, get my hands a wash. I, I like I like food I have to work for, like, yeah. you know, like okay. salon prawns and like chicken wings and stuff like that. I like to, it, it feels like a project to me. Oh no, I'm literally the opposite. I can't have chicken on the bone. Oh, you're one of them. Yeah, but it's right, weird. Chicken wings, I'm fine. But if like if you put me with like a roast chicken that still had like the bones and stuff in like yeah I can't I don't know what it is yeah, I can't my, do it. My other half used to be like that. He's actually changed because basically I refuse to take chicken off the boat. I'll carve the chick. I'll carve <laughs> the you know the roast yeah. up obviously. But like he's fine now. Like he yeah he used to be like oh I can't do it on the boat. I'm like why? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Let's a, talk about. I know it's a thing, but it's never been a thing to me. 
Okay. Do, do you feel better? I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. It's a safe space. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's all about. It's obviously we talk about it. We feel better afterwards. Exactly. Speaking of feeling better, your music makes mm. me feel very good. Like I said today, like I've been I've been bopping along to it all day. And I love having a singer songwriter like on the show because I like to kind of dive into like the why, like how the musical journey started. I've mm-hmm. had people on here who've said like, you know, they fell in love with an instrument. They've watched songs or they've like seen a certain person live and thought, I'm going to do that. How did that journey start for you? Um, it's funny. I was talking about this the other day uh, with a friend of mine. Um so I, I mean, I've been singing since I was probably seven years old um, wow. in my bedroom. I learned to sing listening to Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, Marvin Gaye, um, and then big names. I mean, the 80s, so like, but also like, you know, like Usher and like Boys to Men and those kind of like, you know, American R&B groups and artists yeah. and stuff. Um, it wasn't quite hairbrush in the mirror, but pretty much just in my room, just learning like where they breathed and how they, how they crafted songs. And then I... Um, I got a producer from London got in touch. I was with an agency doing some like little modeling gigs here and there in my teenage years, like catalog stuff and whatever. And this producer got in touch with my agent and said, we're looking for a singer. I just literally told her that I wanted to sort of look into getting into a, a boy band or auditions and stuff yeah. um, as a means to an end. Not because I was like, I want to be in a boy band, just like to mm. get into a group and get some experience and stuff. Um, and then I kind of went to London and I sang for him and he was like, you're not strong enough to be a solo artist yet, but I'd like you to be like one of the front lead singers of a, of a group I'm putting together. And then yeah. we signed with Warner Brothers. It was a massive record deal in like 99. So it was like Spice Girls Money Time is what I call it. They were just throwing money at yeah. I mean, ridiculous budgets <laughs> and advances. Um, and then we were on the label for like a couple of years. We got dropped. Um, but when you get dropped from a label, you get to keep the advance. So I took a little time out from music because I was quite sort okay. of burnt and hurt by it all. And what had gone down is like, my dreams have been taken from yeah. me and all this drama. Um, and then I had my... And my manager drove up to my hometown from London. It's about a two hour drive. And he came to see me. He said, I want, I think you're a great writer. And I want to kind of start looking after you and getting you writing sessions. And I was like, sure. Like, I kind of like, I, I'll believe you when I see it. Yeah. And then I started writing. I mean, I was writing songs for like at the time, Craig David and Blue and Lamar. But um, wow. I realized that I'd written these songs and they were my stories. They were my emotions. They were my feelings. And I, I didn't think that anyone could sing them better than me. So I kept them for myself. I <laughs> love that. Yes. And then, yeah, and that's how I made my first album at the time, which came out in 2005. So that's kind of 10 years in 10 minutes or 10 seconds, to be fair. But um, yeah, and then from then, I've just been flying the flag for independent artists. Um, I think I was one of the first soul artists in the UK to do it all by myself and sort of own my wow. masters and license uh, to various labels around the world. And, you know, I went on tour and did like headline jazz festivals and shows all over the place. I saw this. I've yeah. I've always wanted to go. It's Montreal, is it? The yeah, the Montreal Jazz Festival. I headlined it. It was the most insane show I've ever performed in my life. 15 piece band, 200,000 people, all singing wow. my song. It's like, this is real. But the thing is, that was in Canada. In England, like people knew me and recognized me and so on and knew my music, but I never really crossed over in a big yeah. way here. And that just showed me that, you know, the UK is wonderful and it is a superpower within the industry, but it's a tiny little island. You can be so successful outside of it, but obviously everyone pegs their hopes and dreams on making it in where you, where you live, where you're from. And it doesn't always have to be like that, you know? Um, you know though, I love having these conversations because Mm -hmm. there's a few things that I kind of want to pick apart and kind of ask you about. But I think the first part is obviously it's the determination with you. Mm -hmm. Clearly, like there's that. Obviously, you knew. Obviously, going into the like with the singer songwriting, or whether it was just kind of like owning your craft, I guess. Like, did you think, like, when, especially kind of when you got dropped, to then go on and headline like that big festival? Like, how did you? Was there like a moment where you look back and thought, "Fuck yeah, I did that." Yeah, I mean, I've always. I think it comes from like being, you know, biracial, you know, of mixed heritage. I've always been, I've always felt like I'm in my own lane. I don't necessarily, yeah. it's not about identifying with black or white. I've just always been on my own road as, yeah. a, as a human being. And that's the mindset I've always had. And my parents and my family are like massively supportive of what, of what I do. 
you know, I've been chasing a dream since I was basically eight years old. Um, and they were like, get your education, get this, get that. And then when they came to the signing party, they were drinking champagne. They were like, okay, we get it now. <laughs> and they saw my first headline show and they were like, yeah, our, our son can sing. He's He's been telling us all along and now he's actually doing it. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's obviously setbacks as with anything in life, but yeah. I think that I've always just been like, why well, I put my mind to, I will succeed and I will make it happen. Um, and, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a great team of people and having across throughout my career, I had a great team of people all around me that have been very supportive. And, you know, I was running my own business, had my own label at the age of 22 um, wow. and releasing my own music. And that, you know, was a lot, there's a lot I didn't know about, you know, so it was great to have such a solid uh, bunch of people around me that kind of guided me in the right direction away from the, the ugly parts as much as possible um mm -hmm. and yeah i've just kind of always been flying my own little flag and people seem to listen and like it which is good so <laughs> that's no, it is good it's very good in fact and i was like i was listening today and then i was i can't remember what um ain't no stopping us or i think it was oh, and then i heard a, yeah like i heard a voice that i was very familiar with and vula i was like yeah, yeah. yes okay and i was like straight away i was like these like powerhouses the pair of yours yeah no she vula and me i, I met vula i think it was maybe back at you know 10 rooms um in london it was quite an infamous yeah. um open mic event run by my friend patrick and uh i think i first met vula there um and then we she signed with warner brothers as a songwriter and i was on universal so we both had a bit of money in the bank and we were like should we go to america for three months and just write songs she was like, bitch, yeah, let's go. So we literally like, yes. we, the label like covered our flights and stuff. We covered our hotel. Um, and we went over there and we just literally, because she's the same as me. She's she's very social butterfly. I call us Chatty Cathy. It's like, you know, we'll become friends with anyone in any given yeah. circumstance, wherever we are in the world. And we went over there. Obviously the label, the, the publishers had, had arranged sessions for us. But then we'd meet other people out on Sunset Boulevard or down at the um at the this gay bar, the Abbey, and you sort of, you know, just because Hollywood is very much a who's who. Like everyone's yeah. there trying to make their way in, whether it be you know entertainment or otherwise. So, you know, having a cigarette in the smoking area and you come back inside and you've got a writing session with like a Grammy Award winning nominated producer just <laughs> from so random. <laughs> so they're like, the best conversations I had in the smoking area. Exactly. Um, so yeah, Vula came over and then we wrote a song. It was called uh, Thinking About You. It was on my second album. Um, we wrote a bunch of other stuff as well that may, one of them might get on the new album. But, um, mm. but yeah, she's just, she's just my people. Like, you know, when you identify with your tribe and like, you know, whether it's, you know, doing shots of tequila or, oh my God, I just had a flashback. <laughs> but like a so, core memory has just been unlocked. <laughs> literally just hit me. So that's one of my favorite stories. So we were in LA and her friend Lisa, who sang Red Alert for Basement Jacks, Basement she, Jack, she yeah, was in yeah. Hawaii. So she was home in Hawaii and it's only a four hour flight from LA to Hawaii. So Lisa was like, get your ass over here. So we got on a plane. And we stayed on Waikiki Beach and we were on the beach and we'd gone, there was this chicken wing shop again on the beach <laughs> side. Some of the best swings I've ever had. And basically we just got this like huge box of chicken wings and it was like 35 degrees. We're on the beach in Hawaii. And there was this couple getting married behind us in the grounds of this hotel. And me and Vula were like these bystanders just waving chicken wings in the air going, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Love is like who salutes and congratulates someone with a fucking chicken wing in their hand? That was Everyone's phone like, confetti, never... you're there with chicken bones. <laughs> Just juices going down the side of our cheeks, covered in sand and sweat with a chicken bone going, congratulations. So yeah, that's Vula. There we go. <laughs> I legit, I feel like I don't I need a night out with you guys. Oh, you <laughs> do. Yeah, you might you might go home a little bit broken, but it'll be great. It's okay. Things that are broken oh. can be fixed. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the second the second part of what we what you just said was about like, you know, you we're doing like the songwriting and you mentioned obviously like Craig David and Blue and whereas these songs that you were writing, they were your, like, they were your story to tell. Yes. How do you navigate that? Like with the whole, you know, has there been songs that you've kind of let go because you thought, you know, that that's, that's not for me or has it always been like, okay, this is from, because I can tell in your songs, there is a lot of heart in them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, I mean, I, I literally, I, I found an old box of stuff. So I live in Scotland now with my other half. And I found an old box of like old notepads from when I was like probably 10 years old. And they're just 
full of lyrics, full of poems. Wow. And I think like back then I was, I suppose, trying to figure out what, what is it to, to write a song? But the thing is, there is no template. Like for me, the more honest you are, it's actually a therapy for me. Yeah. Like literally if it's something I've been through or I mean, you know, a friend's called me and they're going through a tough time. I'm not, obviously I'm not naming names, but like it, when, when they hear the result and I'm like, I wrote this about you for you. Um, you know, obviously it's released to the masses, but just so you know, this is, this is, I hope this is a help. And I think, cause I've written songs of my own experiences, whether it be coming out as gay or mental health, depression or whatever it might be. Uh, once that song is out there, it's like you just said about your bugbears. Like once you've got it out of your system, you feel yeah. so much better. Um, and also sometimes when the songs come on shuffle, it makes me cry, you know, because yeah. I feel like that was a really shit time for me. And yeah. That song is, I mean, it's not like Save My Life, it's very drastic, but like it got me through yeah, what I'm going through. through. And when you put a song like that out into the, into the, you know, into the, the cosmos and you get a message on Instagram or Facebook saying, you know, my son was suicidal, he heard your song and he's still here. That stuff like that really That's hits. powerful. That yeah. really hits. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's the power of music. You never know, like, who's who you're going to affect or who, who's going to mm. feel what um and i try and write songs so they're not so subjective like they're quite generic in the sense that it can mean what it means to you for you, yeah. you know, i know what i wrote it about um there's a song in particular you're not alone um that i released in lockdown and i wrote it 10 about 10 12 years before and i was just in a really low point like i'd left my manager and i was feeling very lost and i was still living in london and trying to make ends meet and you know a lot going life. on yeah. Um, and I wrote You're Not Alone. And then I really, I just was in lockdown and I was just like, I feel like people need to hear this. So I put it out and we filmed a, a sort of piece together video of some footage of me up in a lockside in Scotland and then some archive footage from the internet and pictures of me at Gay Pride with the flag. And just, it's just saying, you know, everyone has got their something and you just need to know you're not alone in what you're going through. Yeah. You know, you're not the only one. And I know it can feel like that at times, but, you know, you are part of a tribe that are all suffering the same thing or something similar and you just need to kind of be i think the more verbal you are the more likely you're going to get some sort of assistance or you know from a stranger or from a friend you don't know yeah no honestly i have so much respect for for that and it's i, I love again like i keep saying it, like i love having these conversations because mm. i have a weird relationship with music like that like i can't sing i can't do anything like <laughs> talent wise you just but, enjoy it yeah. I just enjoy it. I mean, yeah, but it's I have a weird relationship with like lyrics and like melodies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. They, I, I love the fact that you know they take you right back to that moment. When it comes to your like your songwriting process, like you mentioned there about like the highs and the lows, does it feel weird listening back to that, especially when you've got people singing those lyrics back to you now? <laughs> like, how how does that feel? Um, I think. For me, it's it's quite grounding because you you know, I mean, I did a headline show in London at the end of January, and I was singing songs. I mean, I wrote "Set the Tone" in 2000, yeah. 2000 and you know, we're twenty three years down the line, and it still sounds fresh as fuck, and I still love it. Yes, I like, never get bored of singing this up, but I'm like, no, because I remember the guy I was then when I wrote that song, and it's the same with any song that you you know. The great thing about music is it can literally, like you say, take you back to a moment in time when you first heard that record. Like my parents, I remember when I was younger, I couldn't sleep when I was uh, like sort of four or five, I had real bad issues with sleeping. And I would just sit on the stairs and mum and dad would just be slow dancing in the front room to Marvin Gaye, sexual healing. Slow oh, dancing, nothing else was going on. Stop. But I just remember that memory of me sat in my PJs at the top of the stairs and just looking at my parents and how in love they were. And that song will always remind me of that moment in time, you know? That's so, like a um, movie moment, that is. Oh, yeah, that's probably. that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that singing songs and taking myself back to when I wrote them, it's just a reminder of how far I've come and how much I've done. And it's quite a proud moment, but it also, like I say, it just, it just shows you how much you can change and grow as a person, I guess. Yeah. Do you so, know what I love, though? Especially now, speaking to obviously your brilliant self like hearing your influences of like like marvin gay stevie wonder like even usher like 
and then hearing you say like about the songs that you're still singing at your headline show recently it's like your influences and obviously your voice and stuff has quite clearly stood the test of time and like you're yeah. putting out this kind of like this work that as you just said like still feels fresh as fuck it's brilliant yeah. i think that i think it, there's like again there's no template to write a song i think that for me i'm all about making timeless classic music yeah. because you know i um you know i listen to artists now that you know were alive were, well i mean i wasn't even born when they yeah. were superstars um and you can still play uh, an Al Green or a Luther Vandross or a yeah. Michael Jackson or whoever. you can still play a song now I mean Quincy Jones anything that man touches is just yes. gold. but like yeah I just think that I was like I want to I want to make music like that you know I feel like right now it's very much a singles market I think that there's a lot of yeah. just throwaway shite out there and you know the real crooners the real songwriters who are trying to make something with a bit of substance are getting overlooked because the labels it's just flashing the pans stars, isn't it it's like whatever uh, has a big, the biggest the following yeah so i just feel like it's there's something i said to someone said the other day and it was about trying to be heard amongst all the noise and i think that's a real key thing like when you're in the studio like what what about this song is going to stand out and yeah. make you be heard and also people will know it's you like what what is identifying about this song is it you know is it i mean my first album was very influenced by motown and soul my second album was very influenced more so sort of like outcast and the kind of yeah. edgy celo green niles barkley like those kind of artists because i love i mean i love all music it's so difficult to to say oh you know this album sounds like this but there's there's always traces of what's who's come before us for artists that are releasing music yeah. now like it's, it's very rare that you can say that's completely original and that's just them. Like there's always going to be elements of something because that's what we grew up listening to. That's yeah. what that's what we're, so we learn our craft from, you know? So how, how do you feel to that? I think that you've kind of like in a roundabout way, you're already kind of answered this, but how do you feel, especially being in that kind of industry for the amount of time that you have with how things are kind of going at the moment with the whole kind of TikTok generation like you've got these kind of songs that are being released and then are getting released again but sped up three times and it's you're kind of like why (laughs) like i don't know Um, that's just obviously a personal opinion but i'm just like why yeah i totally so i'm doing my master's right now in music business management at westminster and amazing it's a it's a tiktok for me is is why yeah like five years ago that wasn't even a word or a phrase yeah and now you've got artists who are being told by their label bosses unless this goes viral we're not releasing it like that is a tragedy yeah that's a tragedy in itself for me like i think the one good well one of the good things that tiktok has done is that you know i've got friends of mine who probably wrote that classic club track that's been sped up three times over and it's been really and when they released that song the first time around, there was no Spotify, there was no TikTok, there was no iTunes, yeah. there was no nothing. It was just the power of clubs playing the songs, DJ spinning it, people mm-hmm. going out and enjoying it, um, and investing in artists and buying CDs and buying vinyls and buying the remixes. Yeah. So the fact that a song that's 20 years old gets a rebirth, I think is great. That I love. Because, you know, that songwriter may not, or that artist may not be doing much right now, yeah. and they just get a paycheck. Yeah. So for me... I'm like, if it's spurring people on to make more music and to be reminded of how great they were at one point and yeah. that they are still great and that's first they want to do more music, that's a bonus. As far as I'm on TikTok, I, I've posted probably four times. I've had about a thousand views on each post. Um, I've been told I need to be more personal on it. And like, but me, I post Instagram stories. Yeah. So that it's, I feel like everyone's got their particular platform that they're, they, yeah yeah of course so it's more on you probably post on there and share it to here and here so i'm an instagram app to be honest um and obviously i could just post a video on instagram save it to my phone and then post it onto tiktok afterwards and kind of it's a lot of fucking work though isn't it <laughs> it's just one more I'm thing tired. to deal with i just there aren't enough hours in the day seriously um <laughs> It's almost like, you know, I know I'm an artist and I have to have a presence on TikTok, but do I? 
do I really? <laughs> no, I, I just can't be asked. Anyway, um, so yeah, I think TikTok has its benefits. I think for you know new artists who are trying to break through, and obviously those. I mean, there's a guy called Austin, someone who's done some amazing remixes on Instagram. Yes, been... Mills, I think his name's right. Yes, I know See, exactly. I'm here, I'm here for all of that. Yeah. You know, he just released, a, I just released a track with Shaka Khan. I think it's a cover of Ain't Nobody. And I'm like, yes. the guy's got himself a metal deal. He's a badass producer. If you're watching, mate, I want to work with you. Um, <laughs> but so, things like that, I, I love finding the talent on there. Um, yeah. I don't necessarily like the workload that I have to do for it. Have you kind of seen it with, um, obviously, I feel like everyone kind of knows who she is now, but like Ray, mm. like what she kind of went through and then the power of TikTok, you know, it took that song and it, you know, blew it out of the water. Like you heard it yeah. with like, um, I think it was Camille, the the song, British songwriter, yeah. um, wrote um, Blue, the David Guetta and Bieber Rex that, yeah. that took it on. Yeah. And it's like that song was like shelved and it's like so that kind of thing like i do agree with but it's it's the like george ezra green green grass sped up three times like it was a decent enough song on its own you don't need to speed it up three yeah it ain't broke don't fix it yes exactly (laughs) yeah like you say i mean you know i mean the the ray story really touched me because obviously i've I've been there um yeah. having been signed and dropped and the thing with her is you know she it's not like she was she was doing nothing the girl had hit upon hit upon hit she was feature vocal for yeah. so many tracks um so i think for her like this even though she's ended up being an in, in, independent artist i think it's the best thing could happen to her yeah. i think this, the money that was been spent on her by the label and the pub the pub the profile she got off the back of that yeah. um was a massive bonus for her as far as setup is concerned yeah i think every music listener lover out there we all love a story we all love to support the underdog or someone who we really feel for you know you feel that emotional connection with someone who's, who's been through such yeah. a publicized shit show with her label mm-hmm. um so i'm just like i just applaud her i know a guitarist i've never actually met ray but I've, i know a guitarist quite well and He's just like, he was, he just jacked in playing guitar because yeah. Ray wasn't doing anything. And then she called him and said, right, off we go. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> yeah, pack your bags. Go to 10, the singles were number one, we're going on tour. He's like, oh, fuck. All right, cool. Let's go. <laughs> but it's just, it's that knock on effect. That's on my 12 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay. So back to you now. Mm-hmm. Speak to me. You've just obviously, you've just dropped a brand new single, which is uh-huh. brilliant. Thank you. Tell me about it, because I'm getting like a very kind of like I want I don't want to say house music, but it's kind of giving me like a I don't know. It's giving me like a, it's like a <laughs> it's like I don't so know it's how... a dirty house soul. Um, yeah, I like that. Uh, so too much. Um, a friend of mine, Tiger Smith, the producer, um, he gave me a shout uh, just before lockdown, actually. Um, it was like, so basically Dan Kaplan, who wrote These Days for Rudimental, he had written I a I love his version of No Letting Go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yes, the boy, like, he's just got him with, yeah. um, with Ryan Tedder, who's obviously Mr. Mr. Hit, hit songwriter himself. Yes. Um, but yeah, so Dan had basically written a chorus on, excuse me, this beat that um, Tiger Smith had. And, he, and then he called me and was like, I need a top line. I need like... I need you. Yeah. I was like, cool. So I went <laughs> in, took my other half actually with me because he was in town for the day. And I was like, I'm really sorry. Like, I just need to go to the studio for a few hours, do this song, do the vocal, and then we'll scooch out for some lunch or some dinner. Um, so we went up to North London and it's it's like, I've always written songs that are of the moment that I'm in. So if yeah. I'm pissed off and single, I'm going to tell you about it. If I'm in love and happy and soppy, I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> so honest. You're a very honest person. <laughs> yeah, I was there with my other half, who I'm now engaged to. I'm very, very happy. But Congrats. it's also like, so the song is, it's, it's, it's an anti-love song. It's, right, you know, I was going to say this because, like, you rocked up there with your with your fiance. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you basically, I was like, yeah, it's dark. It's meant to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's an anti-love song. Um, is it? You know, we've always we've all been there where we've you know. I guess, chase the affections of someone who wasn't worth our time, or maybe it's that friend that ghosted us and screwed us over, or, you know, whatever it might be. We've all been that sort of 
a slightly angry person. At, but also there's a lot of people out there who are single and very happy and yeah. very independent and they pride themselves on that. And if they find love, they do. If they don't, they don't. It's not, it's not top, a top priority for them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Dan had done the chorus and I was like, right, I want to do, I used to dream about you. I was like, okay, cool. And he was up tagging. He was like, oh yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. And then basically we recorded it before lockdown. And then he, he literally rang me last month and was like, our song's a banger. I was like, I know. Like, I told him this when we fucking wrote it. And he was like, should we put it out? And I was like, well, I actually want to release a single in February. I want to spend this year doing singles, probably three or four more, and then the album will come um, next year. Yeah. Uh, and the singles are going to be very different to each other because I don't, I sing soulfully. I don't need to make soul music, if that makes sense. Because yes. um, it have yeah. that, that tone on it anyway. So, um, so yeah, I'm putting out an EP, I, I think in probably May, of like three live recordings from the the, the live show and then two new, stra- new tracks. Um, but yeah, it, um, it was a bit of a departure from my normal sound, but I'm quite happy about that. And also I'm like, what is my sound now? Like the two albums I've released, are, one's eight, what, 20 years old and one's 18 years old. So what I'm making now is not going to sound like what I made then because it's a different time. Yeah. Um, I've grown um, as a as an it artist. It still made me like pull that face though. Like the older albums make me like, ooh. And then I heard yeah. that, I was like, ooh. So yeah. regardless, 20 years, yeah. 50 years, you yeah. know, 100 years, it's yeah. still making me pull that face. <laughs> it's bank face, that's what we call it. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm going to keep making music that, that gives people that face that's what i want to do <laughs> there you go because um, that to me is a true show of like you did something really good and when you got the downturn bit or the, or the frown it's like oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> kind of forgot who i was for a moment when i was yeah. <laughs> <Our> body experience. <laughs> oh, what is happening to my leg <laughs> <great>. <laughs> with with your kind of like experience now of like the music industry or even just in life in general you know you're very open with like the highs the lows you know allowing yourself to be happy is you know what what advice would you give to someone whether they're just starting out on as a new artist or you know they're just having a bit of a shit day like how what what would you offer them not offer Um, them words of wisdom um i mean i i i'm one of my favorite phrases is do whatever makes your heart happy as in and that's across the board like if if you're if you're hung over and all that's gonna make you feel better is a liter of coke and a 12 inch pizza fucking order it don't sit yes. on the car procrastinating and being mad at yourself because you want dirty food there's nothing wrong with dirty food and I guarantee you will feel better afterwards. Maybe with a liter of ice cream as well. Who knows? But I'm just like, do whatever makes your heart happy. As far as the industry is concerned, ugh, it's 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 tough. Um, yeah. You've got to have a very thick skin, which can have a good and a bad effect because you kind of become a little bit numb because you maybe expect the worst in people rather than trying to look for the best. Yeah. Um, you know i think there's so many people that can tell you so many stories i think you just need to i don't say stay true to yourself that's so cheesy and cliche but (laughs) if you know who you are and what you represent and who your tribe are then that's your best start like i'm a big a big fan of of i'm you know we're talking again in, in my masters about tribes and about communities and like where you align yourself you don't have to align yourself with anyone. You can totally be, you know, in your own lane, in your own little bubble. But if you're making music, you need to think, you know, who am I aiming this at? Who who was going to listen to this? Who, and then, you know, be prepared for the comparisons to other artists, because obviously, you know, the industry needs to understand or liken you to someone else to understand you. And so does the listener. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's why on Spotify or Apple Music, you go on this journey where you have the other related artists, which yeah. to be fair, I found some banging tunes on of artists I've never heard of before. So I kind of appreciate that. But obviously it's a computer telling you what you should be listening to. Yeah. So swings and roundabouts. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, just in general, like if if anyone's having a tough time, then I think, you know, I say reach out to your nearest and dearest, but also I know from firsthand it's sometimes easy to speak to strangers. I don't mean like just walk up to some random on the street, but speaking to someone that you don't know as well yeah. and kind of pouring your heart out to them 
can feel very different and have a different result than if you were ringing up your mum or your dad or your sister or your brother or whatever. Yeah. I think some, some things are easier to say to someone you don't know as well than they are to the people you love the most. Um, no, I massively agree with that. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's from trial and error. Like, you know, yeah. I've, I've done that myself. I mean, my parents, literally, I'm, I'm as you've probably gathered, I'm quite an open book and quite verbal. Um, I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, my parents know I mean, everything about me, same as my brother um, and my other half. You know, I've got nothing to hide. There's no skeletons yeah. or anything like that. But that's come from being 43 years old and living a bit of life. You know, yeah. and if you're young and you're confused about your sexuality or your direction in life or where you want to be going and where you're heading and stuff like that, you know, parents aren't necessarily always the best people to speak to because some parents tend to forget that they were that age at one point and they're yeah. rather than trying to rather than being a friend to you they're trying to be a parent and that there's a difference um so you want to get the answer you're looking for basically <laughs> if you, yeah but saying that you know my, my say my parents are incredible and they've always been in my corner and have always understood and just taken me for me so yeah. i'm very lucky in that respect I love that. To be fair, speaking of lucky, I feel very lucky to be able to spend my Monday evening Aww. with your brilliant self. I'm having a lovely chat. Good. Well, that's what we like. That's what we like. Ooh. I do, however, ha I have three final questions for you, oh. and they're musical related. And I, I feel like the first one isn't going to take a lot, but okay. does there need to be a song playing to get you on the dance floor? And if so, which one? Oh, I mean, I'm a <laughs> DJ, so to be fair, I play songs every week that I love to listen to. Um, like, I do do requests, obviously, but I, I'm i a massive fan of old school R&B, like yeah. Club Classics, CeCe Peniston, Robin S, um, yes. Pump Up the Jam, um, Black Box, Right on Time. I think if I'm out dancing, any, any kind of like... Jackson Five or Stardust, music sounds better with you. Yes. Um, any any of those. Um, and then to be, I mean, if you if you come to Camden on a Saturday night, you'll you'll find me DJing, and I pretty much just dance my ass off the whole night to, the, to my own music. It's very self indulgent, but I do play a really good set, and I really enjoy what I'm playing. Sure, um, I love. You literally, you're the first person who has come up when I've asked that question to. They've everyone else has kind of given me like a real like what's like what sounds cool what sounds cool kind of answer whereas you've literally just reeled off a playlist <laughs> yeah, I, can't give like, one yes. I can give you an era like anything 90s r&b or house i think is a surefire anything bet. just be a pho phone ringing i'll be there dancing <laughs> yeah literally um yeah that i think that 90, 80s and 90s is my go-to if I'm out on a night out and I want to go and dance. And I, yeah. I was, where was I? I went to, I think I went to Freedom Bar with my friend Chantel. And just for the last half an hour, she was like, should we just go downstairs and dance? I was like, yeah, let's yeah, go swing on a pole. Good. Let's go swing on a pole. <laughs> and we literally went down there and a couple We've of bar. And we just danced <laughs> like fucking teenagers for half an hour and just had like the best blowout. It was so much fun. You need it. I feel like it's such yeah. a healthy kind of coping mechanism. Just throwing some shapes, some music. Yeah. I think like, you know, we, I mean, we all work as in we all like people work so yeah. hard. And I think, you know, you can become too consumed in your work and, you know, if you've got a family, then there's that. And you just, you need to make some time for you. You know, I'm not saying leave your child at home without a babysitter. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying like <laughs> your family, but you do. I think everyone needs that outlet, you know, and I think that I'm quite lucky as a creative because like I say, obviously I write songs, but I also play music every week. So I get yeah. to kind of release that energy and that creative spirit in me on a weekly basis, whether it's, you know, with pen and pad or it's in a, in a bar or a club or whatever. So I love yeah. that one. I'm definitely going to be spending a a Saturday night in Camden now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hunting you down. I'll get Buddha down as well. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll book, I'll book Monday off work just to be on the set. Yeah. Just to make sure, yeah. On the flip side of getting you on the dance floor, I find it very interesting and I feel like I, I don't know what to kind of expect um, with the answer of, um, from yourself with this one. 
But obviously, from being a singer-songwriter and writing those songs that kind of pull the emotion out of people, is there a song or an album that kind of pulls the emotion out of you? Or as if, like, it soundtracks, like, a part of your life? Um... Mm. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I, can't, I, know that. Um, I think... I think Marvin Gaye, What's Going On, is one of the most incredible pieces of work to ever go in my ears. Um, the way it's been created that every song flows into the next one and what he's talking about when he wrote it, what, 40, 40 years ago uh, or 30 years ago? And you listen to what's going on in the song now and it's the world we live in is exactly the same. Yeah. Like he, what he's talking about, social issues, about how we're killing the planet. No, the whole album is just, for me, is is one of the all-time best pieces, best bodies of work, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the, the final hilarious that Barry Gordy was like, oh, it's not your best work. I don't think we should release this. I was like, are you mad? <laughs> uh, I mean, are we listening to the same thing? Um, of yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I think what's, that was going on album for me, um, yeah, that's probably... The one it's, yeah yeah definitely like i mean whether i'm making a sunday roast or i'm out for a walk in scotland with my other half and we're you know doing some hiking yeah. or driving or on the tube like any track from the album comes on this like that yes it's feeling it's it a sense of calm good. isn't it I, I love how music does that uh, yeah it's, it's funny we were talking the other day again in class and we were saying like music has gone from something that suits our mood to listening to something to suit what we're doing. And I thought that was really interesting. Like you've got yeah. your playlist for when, you got your playlist for when you're cooking, you got your playlist for when you're going to sleep, you got your playlist for on the way to work. It it is not so much about the mood or the feeling, it's about the moment you're in and what you're doing is where you kind of connect the songs. Um I mean I've got loads of playlists for various moments in my week. Um Including one called Family Yoga Time, which is the best going to sleep bath music ever of oh, life. Wow. I never even knew Family Yoga was a thing. I was a playlist. I just got that was a but thing. Honestly, bath time, candle, Family Yoga Time playlist. <laughs> Guild to a fuck. So, yeah. And literally, I'm literally what I'll be doing after this. I'm going to light my festival scented candle. There you are. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a bath and listen to some <laughs> Family Yoga Time. <laughs> You're welcome. You can thank me. Brilliant. Like yeah. <laughs> Amazing. One final question for you. You mean, this is a bit of a controversial one, but if there was one song that you would just like to put in a box, kind of seal it and kind of push it to the side, never to be heard again, what song would it be? Um, This song I would kick off a cliff, I would push off the side of a boat and tie rocks to it. i tie rocks to it. Um... It's got to be either the Crazy Frog song or I'm Blue Dabba Dee. <laughs> Do you know what? You're the second person <laughs> this series to hit me with the Crazy Frog. Mm-hmm. I don't... I just... I, I, I can't. I don't <laughs> understand. It actually makes me angry. I don't understand how this I can hear your voice change. <laughs> like, I'm physically shaking. I'm not really. Um, yeah, I would literally tie... Um, a bank vault to this song and just drop it in the ocean and leave it to, to, for the rest of the telly. Yeah, I can't. It's, it's even the it's um the video. Remember, he was just stood there yeah. naked with a, a like, biker jacket he, on. Was he an animated character that all the kids loved, and that's why it went to number one? Is that where it came from? I don't. Or is it someone that actually created? I don't know. There is some kind of genius in if it was just someone in a, a producer or someone in the room who was like, right, I'm gonna make this animated character and I'll make a song that's really fucking irritating to go with it and just go out in the world and see what happens. I mean, good on you. Like you made some coin. Fair play. You know. You but... remember I don't know why this just popped into my head, but you remember, wasn't there one about a hamster as well? Mm-hmm. There was a ham like the hamster dance or something. I'm gonna go and Google that when we get off this call. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really sorry if I get like some kind of like angry DM <laughs> I'm afterwards. I'm giving you fucking candles and bath time playlist. And you're giving me a hamster song that's probably going to drive me mad for the rest of the night. Cheers. <laughs> it's just the gift that keeps on giving this shit. Yeah, really. Honestly, you've been an absolute delight to waffle with. Like, I really enjoyed it. And I'm, 
I'm so excited to hear the well the EP now. Like, yeah. when can we expect it? Um, is, there, is there a date that? I think May, um, and then the album, I'm actually going to start writing it down in Cornwall um, next weekend. Um, spending this week making, writing the songs um, with some of my favourite people. I can't say who just yet, but it's pretty huge. Um, yes, I kind of saw that little glint then in your eye. Yeah, <laughs> I'm basically pulling in probably my favourite people I've worked with and some of the best people as far as I'm concerned in this country. Um, and there's only going to be Amazing. four of us working on the record, one producer and three writers, including myself. Um, so very close to home, cards close to the chest. Um, but the end result is going to be amazing. And I haven't made a new album in, what was 2000? And I think 2009 was my covers album. So my, as far as originals go, 2008 was Kingdom Fall. So I've not wow. done an album in that long. So it's, it's time. So you ready. ready? Yeah, yeah. You ready? I'm so excited. <laughs> So yes <laughs> i can literally i can see the smile on your face it's beaming yeah. <laughs> yeah. i've like i've written a load of obviously loads of songs over the years and there's probably three or four of those that i'm definitely going to have on the album that um that this person's going to produce up and you know kind of make them all wonderful and polished and yeah. and beautiful um and then i'll be writing the rest of it and yeah down in cornwall i can't wait i've not been to cornwall for years i used to go there for like family camping and caravan trips <laughs> like family there. yoga time <laughs> yeah um, so it'd be weird being down there as an adult and also <laughs> making an album in the countryside, but I can't wait. So yeah. Full circle. Well, yeah. mate, best of luck. Honestly, I'm, I'm so excited. And obviously, and too much. Obviously you've, you've heard the podcast. You've heard the story behind it. Now go and listen to too much. It's on Absolutely. Spotify, buy it wherever you listen to music and yeah, Nate James, welcome. No, welcome. Hello. What am I saying welcome for? You leave it. I am <laughs> Thank you for joining me for a while. Like, welcome to your world, and I appreciate that. That's go. fine. We'll go with that. And I'll see you in Camden for a drink sometime soon. Yes, you will. Hit That's up Vula. Bring the chicken. Done. <laughs> Deal. <laughs>